So welcome to chapter 14, the persuasive speech. Hopefully, your last lecture in your corona-infested homes. Oh, it's going to be so great when this is all over and done with. So today, I just kind of want to go over some of the basics so you folks can review this for the exam. And hopefully, the audio and video quality comes up a little bit better than it does during Zoom. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that when you're thinking of persuasion and the goals of persuasion, you want to think about persuasion along a continuum. And you want to see it as not just one side or the other, but rather a whole number of different possibilities in between the two. Your task, of course, is to move the audience along this continuum. And you can do this in a number of different ways. So you try to figure out where they stand on a particular political issue, and you want to give them scenarios that are going to move them slightly away from what they consider to be their anchor point of their viewpoints that are out there. Now, of course, you can do this in multiple different ways, and you should try to employ these inside of your speech. First, you could try to strengthen or weaken those attitudes, beliefs, and or values. You can try to change the attitudes, beliefs, and or values about a particular issue that's out there. And then, of course, finally, you want to motivate the audience to action. Remember, when you're trying to do these persuasive speeches, one of the biggest areas that people forget about is trying to tell the audience that they should take some kind of action. What you can do personally, what you can do socially, and what you can do politically. Now, when you're thinking about persuasive speaking, you always want to focus in on your audience. So you want to figure out where they stand on a particular issue that's out there. So last semester, I had a student that was taking a speech class here at Cyprus, but he was also at another university. And he was trying to do a speech about Bernie, and he came up to me afterwards and said, gosh, Cyprus students really seem to love Bernie Sanders. And I'm like, well, you know, you should have gauged your audience a little bit more. And when you were presenting those arguments, you were kind of just preaching to the choir. Now, you should ask for reasonable amounts of change, just small little tiny steps that move people towards a particular issue that's out there. You know, just getting them to take small little baby steps in a certain area can lead to larger steps in the future. You should also anticipate selective exposure, because a lot of times, remember, people actively seek out information that supports their own particular opinions, beliefs, values, decisions, and or behaviors. I don't know about you folks and this whole injecting Lysol thing that's going through the media this last week, but my gosh, I have so many friends that believe, well, Trump was being sarcastic about it all. He was being sarcastic to the reporters because he hates the fake media. And of course, when you look at the actual tapes, he's asking Fauci, he's asking Bricks. I don't know how much leeway I'm really willing to give these guys about these particular situations, but their opinions, beliefs, values, and decisions are so gung-ho for Trump right now that even when he says something blatantly wrong, he must have been sarcastic. By the way, every time I've taught you folks something bad, I was always being sarcastic. <laughs> And remember, listeners also actively avoid information that contradicts their existing opinions, their existing beliefs, their existing attitudes, their existing values, or their decisions and or behaviors. So when something flies in the face of another person's particular persuasive structure, oftentimes they'll try to tune it out, saying it never existed. It was fake news. It wasn't ever out there. I never said that. I don't know who that person is. That we actively avoid this type of information because oftentimes, Confronting that information means that we have to think harder and put our brains through more work. Now, of course, you should also think and be culturally sensitive, right? So remember, at any given point in time, there are cultural mores and values that will always pull themselves in with regards to persuasive speaking that's out there. And you should take these into account when you're constructing the actual persuasive speech yourself. You know, there's this notion of collectivistic cultures that are out there in a number of different ways. Uh, Pretty big example of this. I don't know if you folks, uh, anybody watched World Cup last year, but of course, you know, the sort of homophobic slash racist chant that Mexico s uh, screams for El Tree. Uh, some of my buddies had some very serious issues with that, you know, of course, identifying as being Mexican and then at the same point in time trying to be a little bit more liberal in their interpretations of gender and or sex uh, found themselves in kind of a weird sort of rut because they were trying to stay with the collectivism that they felt as being their host identity, but at the same point in time trying to modulate that between what's going on with regards to these particular soccer chants that are going on out there. 
There are also issues of persuasion that have to deal with high power distance cultures, where we give tons of deference and respect to older individuals and their, way, their ways of thinking or their traditions. And this might be challenging, too, for persuasion. Because oftentimes, even as Aristotle once said, when the young try to influence the old, the old will be very stubborn and very belligerent about trying to change their old set ways. Uh, we also have high uncertainty avoidance cultures. So if there is something that we don't know too much about, oftentimes persuading them in a particular direction may be a little bit harder to do, or they might be a little more lethargic because they don't know exactly what's going on. I'm sure for most of you folks, you've seen tons of this with regards to the COVID-19 outbreak and all the different coronavirus information that's out there. How much certainty do I need to have before I'm willing to test a new drug? Gosh knows a lot of people bought a lot of hydrochloroquine out there and now it's having heart attack problems. So was it a good bet to wait for the science? Or for those people that stocked up, it still worked on some of the possibilities? Just today they're talking about this new drug called remdesivir and of course still, it doesn't have 100% efficacy and still hasn't gone through more than just one clinical trial. How much faith are we going to put in in a very uncertain world? Finally, of course, we have long-term orientation cultures. So thinking about the far off future. So for these types of cultures, or when you're thinking about some people that may be a little slower to persuade, they may just have a long-term orientation towards it all. That eventually we'll get to that particular point of view, or eventually we'll get there. If anybody was watching democratic debates between Bernie and Biden, you could see this. Bernie calling for revolution, that we need universal health care right now, Medicare for all. And Biden taking much more of a long-term orientation stance, saying, hey, well, we've got to Obamacare. Let's try to make Obamacare a little bit better, a little bit better, and eventually we might get to a goal that's more in line with what Bernie is calling for. Now, when constructing your persuasive speech, so now you folks are going to be sitting down and you're trying to write out this new outline. Remember, we, if you really want to try and figure out your grade by May 17th, you should start working on your outline as soon as possible for your persuasive topic. There are going to be two major ways in which you can frame your actual speech. And I have a handout that I'll put up online that you folks can take a look over. The two major forms are what we call a problem, cause, solution framework. And then there's also what we call Monroe's motivated sequence. Now Monroe's motivated, you can choose either of these. It's completely up to you. But Monroe's uh, motivated sequence comes from the 1930s and talks about how for every major exigence or an imperfection marked by need or urgency inside of society, you need to take that problem and bring it to people's attention. So again, the same sort of attention grabber that you folks had before. You're gonna draw them in with a question, a story, a joke, these types of things, a quotation, some statistics. Then inside of the body of your speech, well, of course, you're still gonna establish credibility, audience analysis, and a thesis statement. But then your first point is gonna be the need, that there's some need in society, something problematic that's going out there. People are dying from this virus that's out there, right? Uh, then the second point is how do you satisfy that need? Well, we need to get more tests out there. I don't know about you folks, but I heard now it's 119 bucks for an antibody test. Oh man, I am first in line, man. I need to find out whether or not I already got that bad boy over spring break. So you satisfy it by increasing the amount of testing that we can do in the United States. And then you visualize. You try to think of a world where everybody's tested. We know who we can contact trace. We know who wants to put themselves into quarantine so we can get this virus under control. And then finally, you call the audience to action. So in your conclusion of your speech, you say, all right, we've gone over these major areas. Now let's talk about taking it to action. We can go out there, start giving some more money to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, try to get on Quest Diagnostics to get yourself tested because it seems like you're not going to get a free, time, free one anytime soon. And, of course, write Trump. Tell him, hey, we need more tests out there in some kind of way. Now, when you're thinking about your persuasive topic area, or when you're thinking about your persuasive speech, there are some questions you want to ask yourself. And this will guide your research a little bit better when you're trying to analyze what you want to take a look at inside of the actual speech topic. The first is asking, what kind of question is your speech? So you could have a persuasive speech on what we call a question of fact. There are facts that are debatable out there. Well, I'm sure if your friends are any like mine, we're debating about facts all darn day. <laughs> but there are a number of different facts that you can ask and then just go out and find the research and then make some sort of logos type analysis to try and figure out whether or not those facts have presuppositions that are true or false. 
So these concern issues of what's true, what's not true, what does or does not exist, uh, what did or did not happen. Just today, as I was driving down to Cyprus today to shoot these videos, I heard about how now the Pentagon just released or declassified the actual UFO shots that all these ones that got leaked out a couple of months ago now have officially been justified by the U.S. federal government. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, only in the middle of a virus would suddenly somebody say, oh yeah, by the way, um, you know, we got a whole bunch of stuff that says aliens exist. Yeah, check that out, huh? <laughs> uh, what a society, right? But questions like, when will the stock market bounce back? I don't know about you folks, but I'm trying to take like the two or three bucks I have left over right now, trying to figure out if there's some way I can invest it in to get some kind of cash going on. Uh, will we enter back into the Iran deal? You know, we're still having some pretty high escalations and tensions with them. Uh, is there any chance that in the future we might move back into a denuclearization kind of deal with them? Is eating spicy good f uh, food good for you? I'm a complete proponent of this, right? Has capsaicin, increases blood flow, these types of things. But for some of you folks that can't handle chili with more than one flame, <laughs> maybe eating spicy food isn't necessarily that good for you. Uh, were the Ferguson protests, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, were they actually effective? Do you think that now in today's day and age, do people sort of think more about pl police brutality and uh, systemic racism when it comes to the lives of black people? And then finally, gosh, right, this is the biggest debate I'm having every single day, right? Is COVID-19 significantly worse than the flu? Oh my gosh, everybody, it's just, no, it's not like the flu, right? But interestingly enough, the first randomized study came back from Iceland, which only showed true mortality rates at about 3.4 times that of the flu. So it's not necessarily all the way up in the 10 or 11 times that we saw in like Italy or Spain, but some countries actually through social distancing and through advanced medical care significantly decreased the, the actual number of death tolls that they have. In addition to persuasive qu questions on speeches of fact, we also have types of persuasive questions on issues of value. So we should think about sometimes the morality of a particular question that's out there. So this is what you consider to be good or what you consider to be bad, what you consider to be moral or immoral or what's just or unjust. So questions like, is suicide justifiable? So, you know, this is one of the biggest questions that Albert Camus, a gigantic existentialist French philosopher back in the day asked, why shouldn't we just kill ourselves? You know, why should we try to go through this horrible life that's full of nothing but pain and suffering? So is it possible to say, hey, say I quit, right? And do you actually win the game? Who knows? <laughs> is the death penalty moral? So a lot of times when people say, hey, you know, if somebody's taken a life, then an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? But then some other people might make the argument that the death penalty should never be in anyone's hands. The state shouldn't have it, nor should the murderers. So these types of arguments for morality oftentimes make a very interesting claim. Another questionably moral question, right, is that remember that anytime we ever execute somebody, it's never done by a doctor because they take an oath. They take the Hippocratic oath saying that they will never cause harm to another patient that's out there. And by administering death, they find themselves in a moral quandary. How about hunting wild animals for sport, right? So anybody who goes out there, like the dentist guy who went out to go shoot down that lion, can it be justified? Can it be morally justified? If you eat every single piece of that meat, is it somehow justified? Who knows, right? There are plenty of different claims that can go back and forth with regards to this one as well. And then finally, one of the biggest ones you folks have probably been seeing recently, right? Is the economy more important than life? I'm sure you've seen tons of political pundits saying, I would rather die of COVID-19 than give my children the economic burden that we're gonna take on with this economic bailout. I don't know how you folks stand on it, but it's an interesting question about the quality of life that's brought in by having jobs in the economy versus actually having life itself. So, so, so some of you folks that might be unemployed out there right now wondering, gosh, man, how can I make ends meet? And maybe that economy actually is becoming a stronger argument. Or for those of you folks that have lost a loved one to COVID-19, you might say, heck no, I don't care what a dollar bill is worth. It's nothing worth like compared to my grandmama. Now, finally, we have questions about policy. Now, there's always a policy ramification that kind of comes into everybody's speech, and I encourage you to try and find solution steps that happen at a policy level as well. Now, remember that when we move beyond the values and we start to urge the audience to do something, then oftentimes we're dealing with the wide world of policy. 
So things like what should California's laws be on the death penalty? So you know, Gavin Newsom, of course, did impose a moratorium. There's no death penalty going on in California as of right now. But is it right for a governor just to do that carte blanche? Does he have the right to completely say, I don't care what the laws are in California. Under my governorship, I'm going to executive order them out of the entire world. Uh, another question you might ask yourself is, what should the government policy be towards suicide? So if someone tries to take their life and doesn't take their life, are they okay? They haven't harmed anybody else. Should we lock them up in jail? Should we give them mandatory psychology or psychiatry? What should the role of government actually be? Uh, you could go even smaller. I don't know if you folks remember the Harriet Tubman was going to be on the $20 bill back in the day, but obviously that got axed as soon as Trump became president. But another interesting question, right? Should we put a woman on a U.S. currency? Would that help remind us of the women who have helped us out through the history of the United States? And then finally, let's go back to COVID-19 again here, right? So. Uh, who should be getting more stimulus money, right? The businesses or the people? Yeah, as I was driving down here, $870 million that went to the richest companies, all that were publicly traded. The Lakers gave back $4.6 I don't know about you folks, but I sure as hell would like some of that Lakers money. I mean, I get it. I love LeBron. I love Kobe. All that good stuff. But dude, give that, give that money to a poor teacher trying to record a lecture at Cypress College. <laughs> But hey, there is some argument to be said though, right? That if you resurrect the businesses, if that stimulus money goes into the businesses and the businesses are able to still give their, their employees a job, then they'll be in a better position to re-stimulate the economy afterwards. So curious trickle down and trickle up types of economics might play into issues of policy, especially when we're considering throwing around trillions of dollars around this virus. So let's go back to Aristotle, right? Yeah, we're always going back to Aristotle. Man, I've been reading so much of this book while we've been on break, it's insane. <laughs> uh, so Aristotle defines logos, right? So uh, this is the ethos, pathos, logos part of the lecture that I've been complaining about ever since the beginning. Let's see if I can put myself up in next room and see if my head goes right. <laughs> but Aristotle says that persuasion through arguments or the logi, which plural of logos, is when we show truth or the apparent truth from whatever is persuasive in each case. So I can give you examples or, you know, logical arguments from a particular area and then use that to justify a larger major ar argument that's out there. So I can say, well, hey, people are dying because of the spread of COVID-19. Their testing, of course, can minimize this because then people will definitely know to stay home as opposed to go out and protest. And that's an example that I can use to justify why, why we need to have more testing. But inside of the logos, there are a number of different areas that we need to examine even further. First, we have what we call logical appeals. So all logos comes from two different areas. There is what we call inductive reasoning, where you argue from a specific instance back up to a larger general purpose. And then there's what we call deductive reasoning, where we go from a larger general law and argue down to a specific instance. So as far as the textbook's concerned, they talk about reasoning from specific instances, reasoning from causes and effects, and reasoning from sign. All this collectively comes out of an inductive model of argumentation that's been around for, well, about a couple, you know, 50, 60 years. It's this guy, Stephen Toolman. He was actually down at USC before he passed on, I think in the 2000s. But he came up with what was referred to as the Toolman model of inductive argumentation. Now, Toulmin makes a pretty strong argument for how most of us go through our everyday lives reasoning. So for him, he says that every time we're trying to make a logical inference or an inductive argument, there's always some kind of grounds or data that it originally comes from. That there are some facts, some justification out there in the real world that we make a claim from. And that claim can be what we induce about the real world, the larger law, if you will. And it's always based around what he terms a warrant. And here's the part that you folks are going to need to know for the final exam. The warrants actually come in the form of what we call the gas cap. Generalization, analogy, sign or symptom, causality, authority, or principle. So let's take an example of generalization. So let's say, you know, someday you're out there actually walking outside and you're noticing that there's so many more animals out in nature, right? The, the birds are chirping, the squirrels are running around, people talking about coyotes running around in Orange County for crying out loud now. 
But let's say you're looking at birds, right? Let's say you go outside and you see 732 sparrows, right? And then you see 142 ducks flying by. And then, I don't know, you see uh, a couple of owls. Let's say you see 34 owls at night or something along those lines. After you have a large enough data set of a number of owls that are out there, a number of birds that are flying, you might eventually generalize from your observations to a claim that all birds can fly. But you already know where I'm going with this one, right? Because as soon as you say, hey, wait a second, not all birds can fly, you're questioning the qualifier. So in this particular situation, the qualifier is all. So then you come back and say, well, wait a second. I know sparrows, owls, and ducks can fly, but what about the emus, right? What about, uh, let's see here, the kiwis? What about the penguins, right? Uh, so penguins, of course, can't fly. And so you find exceptions to the general rule. And as you find those, you remodify the qualifier. So now instead of saying all birds can fly, you can definitely say some birds can fly. You may be even be able to go as far as saying most birds can fly. So there's always a rebuttal to every major claim, and this fights against the qualifier, which then changes the inductive statement in the, in the first place. Now remember, we don't have to just use generalization. We can use an argument by analogy. So Maybe if we invade Iran, it's going to be like when we invaded Iraq back in the day or something along those lines. Uh, you may use an analogy between two types of scenarios. Or if you're like my friends, right, COVID-19 is like the flu. Oh, yeah, yeah, you right. <laughs> you may also argue by a sign or a symptom. I'm sure you folks have heard a lot about these with disease too, right? Wait a second. If I'm running a fever, if I have shortness of breath, if you lose your sense of smell, I just recently heard on the news that I guess if you've lost your sense of smell, it might also be an indicator that you're not gonna get the deadly type of COVID-19. You're just gonna get a mild to moderate case of it, which is kind of happy because I remember I lost my breath, like or lost my sense of smell right around spring break. So I'm like, maybe I'm an asymptomatic carrier. Who knows, right? Uh, a sign or symptom can also be classically explained like, you know, Let's say you go and you start your car and it starts smoking, right? You know, that might be a sign or a symptom that your car probably needs some work. Uh, there are also arguments by causality or cause and effect. Uh, so something leads to something else that's out there. So, of course, you know, social distancing is trying to stop the causal relationship between sneezes and carrying of the germs. Uh, but you folks usually spend most of your lives completely walking in causal types of relationships. If I work on my speech early, I will get my outline over to Cossum early, and so I will get a better or faster grade. Yay, right? Uh, there are also arguments by authority. I mean, I'm sure you folks have heard about this Dr. Fauci being sexy stuff. <laughs> I love that, right? It's amazing that we finally live at a time where actually like some kind of doctor has some sort of sex appeal. But uh, a lot of times we take things based around their authority. So a lot of you folks, when it came to your, your research assignment or when I was critiquing your outline, the number one comment, of course, I continue to say is, is you gotta find better sources. You folks are putting on stuff from web pages that we don't know anything about. Currently, in this day and age, I only trust PDFs. It's amazing, like, I'm, I'm like, you know what, I'm not trusting anything unless I can pull it down as a PDF. Remember, you gotta smack them with a PDF, right? <laughs> And finally, principles. Sometimes we have maxims or rules of law that oftentimes can give us inductive forms of arguments. So phrases like do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a principle, right? So you've been good to other people that are out there. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You would hope that they would treat you back in the right kind of way. Some of us get burned, but I think over my life, a majority of people have tended to be pretty appreciative of the times where I've treated them well and tend to treat me the same way back. So that sort of takes over inductive argumentation. I also have a deductive argumentation framework that I'll be talking to you folks about in just a second. So again, remember reasoning from specific instances, this would be a warrant of generalization. Reasoning from causes and effect, this would be a situation where we're looking at causality. And reasoning from sign or symptoms, right? Your car is starting to smoke. Hey, maybe there's something wrong with my engine. 
Uh, now, there are some fallacies to logical appeals. Oh man, I wish I could be teaching these to you folks. I loved fallacies back in the day, especially when I'd get into fights with my girlfriend at the time, man. I'd be like, oh yeah, well that's an ad hominem attack, or oh yeah, too crow okay, or oh yeah, that's Pepito Principi. <laughs> uh, she broke up with me shortly afterwards. Uh, but that inside of logical appeals, sometimes we may appeal to an authority as a false sense of proof, right? So. Hey, you know what? I mean, Maryland reported in a gigantic spike of people drinking bleach, you know, to their poison control centers. So if you look at a false authority as a means of proof, you might be in a scenario where, you know, hey, this is not the right type of person to listen to. Uh, stop doing your political viewpoints. Uh, appealing to numbers is truth. Just because we have numbers out there doesn't necessarily mean that they're all or indicative of everything that's going out there. Numbers can be massaged in very, very significant ways, you know? so. He, uh, a lot of times, well, we're seeing this a lot with the virus as well. And then, of course, finally, sliding down the slippery slope. So uh, I'm sure you folks have probably heard the term slippery slope. This is when an argument can completely take it out to what we, we call a reductio ad absurdum. Uh, eventually leads it to a completely illogical final statement. Uh, you're all probably a little too young for this, but back in my day, there was a lot of debate about whether or not we should legalize same-sex marriage. It was a pretty big hot-button issue back when I was in my 20s. And, uh, Curiously enough, most of the arguments about it involve slippery slopes. It was always somebody saying, well, if you let those gay people get married, then you're going to let people marry animals, and then you're going to let people marry their daughters, right? No, of course not, right? At what point in time does gay marriage suddenly lead you to bestiality, for crying out loud? But this reductio ad absurdum, that if you're going to blur the lines of traditional marriage, can eventually lead you to further and further argumentation, can be an incredibly persuasive tool, even if it is a fallacious form of reasoning. Let's go again now to another area of Aristotle, Aristotle's pathos, right? Good old pathos. Uh, the emotional appeals inside of your speech. Now remember, let's go back to his original definition or his talking about it, right? So there is persuasion through the hearers when they're led to feel emotion, the pathos of your speech. For we do not give the same judgment when we're grieving or rejoicing or when we're friendly or hostile. Remember that if you set the mood to your audience, they're going to think differently about your particular persuasive topic. You know, if you're giving a speech about COVID-19 and you just lost your mom to it, odds are nobody's going to suddenly jump up and say, hey man, it's just like the flu, yeah? <laughs> because they're going to be a little bit more receptive to your own personal strife. And for the, a lot of these informative speeches, you folks had a lot of pathos in them, that's for darn sure. But remember that if you set your audience into a mentality where they're grieving about something or rejoicing about something, it's going to change the way in which they look at argument structure. And this is where pathos gets a lot of power. So let's take a second to talk about pathos appeals. Now, emotional appeals, motivational appeals, if you will, they'll appeal to a listener's feelings, their needs, their desires, their wants in some kind of way. And uh, when we think about these, you know, there's a lot of theories that are out there. Uh, one of the most common, especially right now, is what we call prospect theory. So this is where a gain is perceived as less than a loss. So I'm much more likely to get you folks to write your outlines if I tell you, I'm going to drop you from the class unless you give me that outline by tomorrow, then, well, if you get your outline early, I'll give you five extra points. You'll be like, man, five points, who cares, right? Dropping the class, oh my gosh, right? Even if I use the same variable, so this is a lot of interesting research done by Tversky and Kahneman when they were talking about their original po prospect theory. If I offer you five extra credit points for turning your assignment in early versus if I deduct five points if you don't turn it in early, people are much more likely to be motivated by the loss of points than the gain of points, even though it's the same darn thing. It's curious because we na naturally as human beings have a negativity bias that we tend to look at the glass as a little bit more half empty than half full, especially when it comes to things that affect us directly. Another great theory that's out there is what's referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now there's a lot of good research done on this. He's a humanist psychologist out of the 1960s and he talks about how when we're thinking about our own lives, we have a number of different needs that evoke emotional types of responses. And there's a lot of good research that shows that if you build off of this pyramid, you can find major motivational appeals for your audience inside of it. 
He first starts at the bottom, and he says that we all have physiological needs, that at the base level, we need food, we need water, we need air. Right? If I can't breathe, I don't really care much about anything else except for breathing. Right? Unless somebody's literally firing bullets straight into me, <laughs> I'm probably not going to worry too much about anything else that's going on in my life except for trying to get another breath. So physiological needs like food, water, and air are the most uh, Sorry, <laughs> are the most uh, demanding out of all the different needs that we have out there. Uh, moving up from this level, we need to move ourselves into what we call the safety needs. These are issues of security, stability, protection, freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, freedom from chaos, structure, order, or law. So a lot of times after we have our basic needs, we have our food, we have our water, we have our air, then we start to worry about our safety. You know, hey, is there somebody walking around with a shotgun? Is there a killer out there somewhere on the block? Is this virus eventually going to get me? You know, odds are you're probably not too concerned about going through the process of 14 days of self-isolation uh, if you don't have any air. And curiously enough, when people fear the fact that they might be in self-isolation for 14 days, the first thing they grab, food, water, toilet paper. <laughs> But a lot of times, moving from physiological needs to safety needs involves the first step of what we call the hierarchy of needs. Moving from safety needs, we then move up to what we call belongingness and love needs. So after I feel safe in a particular situation, I don't feel like as if somebody's going to shoot me, and I've got enough food to get me through the extra week, then I start wondering about, well, where's my family? Where's my belonging? And this is probably an issue that's affecting a lot of us right now. This notion that friendship, affection, relationships, interpersonal acceptance, uh, I'm sure a lot of us are really missing our friends. We're spending a lot of time sitting on the phone trying to reach back out to them, trying to establish some connection. I lose a lot of my day grading papers and trying to write these speeches, but I also lose a lot of my day waiting for somebody to text me back or wondering what's going on with the conversation. One of my friends I haven't heard from in two weeks, some of you folks I haven't heard from, these issues of, wait a second, could they have died? You know, oftentimes really keep us up at nights. After we feel as if we're belonging or loved by someone else that's out there, then we can move up into what we call self-esteem. This is where we start to evaluate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other people. Now this is an interesting debate because sometimes we wonder, is it really that I need to be loved by others before I can love myself or do I need to love myself before I can be loved by others? But for the most part, a lot of your self-evaluation, self-respect, esteem of others, your strengths, your achievements, your competencies are oftentimes found in the looking glass self, if you remember back to chapter two, and the self-esteem that we get for ourselves from belongingness towards other individuals. Finally, of course, after you've met your self-esteem needs, you can become what Maslow calls self-actualized. And in the self-actualized person, they do what's, what's fitting and done for themselves. Uh, they feel self-fulfillment. Uh, they recognize their own full potential. So he makes arguments like people like Gandhi, of course, had reached this level of self-actualization where he could reach his full potential and liberate all the people of India. But as a curious sort of side note, remember that as he was self-actualized, he was going on hunger strikes, too. So there is some critique of this model, but when you're thinking about your persuasive topic areas, you can place them on the hierarchy. So if you're doing a speech on gun control, of course it addresses issues of safety, right? If you're doing a speech on the welfare system and getting checks or stimulus checks out to people, that gives us basic necessities, things like food, water, these types of things. Uh, making sure that we have ways in which the media can still kind of keep us socially connected in some kind of way, you know, addresses issues like belonging and love. So you should think about these when you're trying to come up with persuasive issues inside of the value aspects of your topic. Finally, let's talk about Aristotle's ethos. <laughs> and this is a great quote that I think I pulled from him because when he talks about ethos or credibility of the speaker, there are three major reasons why speakers themselves are persuasive, for there are three things we trust other than logical demonstrations. So I may have great logic, I may have great pathos appeals, but when you folks are looking at me as an instructor, there are three aspects of me that sort of come across as being persuasive in and of themselves. And these are practical wisdom. Does it really seem like he knows what he's talking about? Does he really seem like he's got some years beyond him? Or is he just blowing smoke up my butt, right? Uh, virtue, the character of me, does it seem like he's a good guy? Does he seem like he's the kind of guy who looks out for his students? And of course, his goodwill. Does he have generosity or some sort of charisma towards the audience that you feel as if 
he has your best interests in mind. He has compassion in some sort of framework. And this all comes out of On Rhetoric, this great, amazing book. You know, <laughs> I think I might PDF it and make you folks read it. <laughs> so when you try to establish credibility, uh, in sort of the modern day context, what Aristotle's quote's really saying is, is, is the person competent? Do they know what they're talking about? Do they have practical wisdom? Uh, do they have character? Do they feel as if they've got virtue to themselves? Do they, have, do they stand up for the right things and stand against the wrong things? And then do they have charisma, right? So do they have that it factor that makes you feel bonded to them, that they've got goodwill for you, they are somewhat empathic towards you, that they've got something that kind of drives you a little bit beyond what arguments or what logical appeals they have inside of themselves. And finally, for our last slide today, when it comes down to supporting materials, their credibility appeals in and of themselves. Uh, this is the degree to which your audience regards you as a believable spokesperson that's out there. Your credibility is also always in the minds of your audience. So you may be in a situation where you're a Trump supporter and you absolutely hate this lecture because I've made those little digs on him in some kind of way. But you may be on the other side, you're like, all right, I love that professor. Sorry, I try not to get too political out here. But remember, your credibility and what you disclose is always in the minds of your audience. They may decide to respect you or not respect you based on something. So one of my Republican friends told me that it's great that Trump pulled the money from the World Health Organization because the leader of the WHO is from Ethiopia. And I was like, racist. <laughs> but it is interesting that just a nationality of a person at the head of an international organization was enough for that entire organization to lose credibility within his own eyes. Also, if Lesler see you as competent and knowledgeable, of good character, charismatic or dynamic, they'll try to increase their levels of credibility about you. So try to give us as much energy as you possibly can. Try to back your stuff up with good claims from great articles. And then, of course, have that little extra bit of dynamism or that little bit of extra charisma, that it factor that gets your message across even better. And then, of course, remember that credibility is framed by culture, and so what makes you credible in any particular situation may not make you credible within another one that's out there. Finally, of course, there are some fallacies, of course, that we can have with regards to credibility. So sometimes, you know, people will just try to overly attack credibility, and this seems to be something in today's day and age. Somebody's a fake news reporter, or I don't trust anything from Bloomberg because he ran, ran against Trump. But uh, there is something to be said, you know, for personal interest. That's why, you know, I try to find research that actually has, you know, the different types of associations for the actual authors so you can see if there is no quote unquote conflict of interest. So there are a lot of personal interest attacks that can happen out there, but this can be fallacious at times, much like I gave with that example of the who. There's also character attacks. When you attack the character of a person saying that because of this action, they somehow of, are, or have bad character. And then fan finally, one of my favorite fallacies, the ad hominem or the ad personum, against the man, against the person, or just simply name calling other individuals that are out there. So I don't know about you folks, but I'm not really waiting for this whole sleepy Joe and I'm gonna beat President Trump like a drum stuff. There's going to be a lot of name calling coming on. Just remember that oftentimes this tends to fall within a very fallacious category.